Okay, good morning everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here in St Francis. I spent a huge part of my career in the hospice world before moving to Queen's two years ago, so it's really lovely to be here. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about my education fellow, but I, just, I didn't actually go to Australia. I didn't go very far away, but I actually had a super fellowship, and I'm very grateful to the funding that All Ireland Institute gave me. So thank you for that, just right at the beginning. Uh, just to, to say that the focus of my fellowship, in a sense, was very closely linked with my PhD, because my PhD looked at palliative care for people with learning disability. And um, as part of that PhD, what actually was one of the products from it was a DVD and manual. <clears throat> and as I developed that, and, and it was out and it was there, and my PhD was over, I thought, well, so what? What am I going to do with this? So as Karen says, I decided to turn that into an online uh, resource that would be open access and available to everyone. And so my project team was a partnership of people that had done my PhD with me or had supervised me and people that I was currently working with at Queen's. And that was quite significant because this online resource has a central theme of partnership working. So the project team it was also about partnership working. Okay, just the background, and many of you in the room, and I know here at, at St Francis and the All Ireland Institute um, have a, a great interest in people with learning disabilities, and that is wonderful, and it certainly is a developing area. Um, but just to, to, to highlight really where I was coming from with this, is that people with learning disabilities, also known as intellectual disabilities, are very much one of our disadvantaged and marginalised groups. And there's a number of reports that have come out um, in different parts of, of the world which herald really concerns around the end-of-life care that this particular population receive. Um, in many cases, it's about professionals not being skilled to care for them. They lack competence and confidence. Um, in hospice, we get very little experience of actually caring for this population. So if we're not exposed to that, we can't always understand their needs. So there's a lot of research studies, um, including the work that I was privileged to do myself, which actually found a wide range of unmet educational needs across all sectors and services um, and within the multidisciplinary team that were unmet and needed to address. But what also is in the literature is this growing evidence base that supports joint working between learning disability and palliative care service. And that, I think, speaks for itself. It makes sense to bring our knowledge, our skills, our expertise together to meet uh, the complex needs of this population. And that was very relevant to my fellowship and what I was doing. So the rationale, if I can start with that, of the fellowship site visit was really to assist the development of an open access, and I'm delighted to be able to call it that, because income generation is very important, but we've got to think about research into practice, and this is really what one way of doing it. And at Queen's, where I'm currently working, um, sometimes if a product is developed out of a study, what we try to do is to put it open access, so it's free around the world. And that is absolutely wonderful. So um, this was to assist the development of that from an evidence-based DVD and manual with a robust service user perspective. So to start with the baby that I was working with, which was this evidence-based DVD and manual, um, it had first of all a robust service user perspective, so I'd got the views of people with learning disability and family carers. But it wasn't just in curriculum design that I had that service user perspective. It was also in curriculum delivery, because we have a, a robust um, uh, we have a group of people who are actors with learning disability taking part in role play, and we have family carers speaking on it. So this was really what I started with, trying to develop within this fellowship into an online resource, and I wanted to update it in some way, because it was a couple of years since it had been done, and there was other new developments out there. The anticipated outcomes then of the fellowship site visits were first of all to create video podcasts during the site visits to further shape and update the content of the online resource, and to better understand how best practice and collaboration could be realised and used effectively to provide equitable care for this population. 
And I also wanted to raise aware, my own awareness of the development of other innovative resources and accessible information which were available and had come out maybe more recently. <clears throat> And so against those particular objectives or outcomes I wanted from the fellowship, I visit two key live examples of good practice. And within this particular area of practice, we have what is known as the Palliative Care for People with Learning Disability Network. Now that's got a big, um, here in Ireland, it's got quite a big uh, number of members, both in the north and the south. Um, it runs a, a lot of different events, and if you want to more about, know more about that, then you speak to me. It's an international and a national network of people uh, over the world. But within this, they have uh, an annual award that they give to people for examples of good practice, called the Linda McInhill Award. And it's given to examples of good practice where there's new developments, something innovative or overall excellence in end-of-life care for people with learning disabilities. And so I visited first the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice in Glasgow, who have got what I can only describe as an excellent project, really showing how partnership work can be actually enacted with this, in this particular area, and also showing some of the outcomes from that which are emerging. And it's called Learning Disabilities and Palliative Care, Building Bridges Supporting Care Project. And this came about really through a scoping exercise from um, one of the uh, educationists who was there in 2011, um, who really recognised the complexities of caring for someone with a learning disability at end of life and wanted to support staff in doing so. And as a result of that, um, this project came about really to bring both the specialty of learning disability and palliative care together in the provision of best quality care for people who have learning disability and end of life care needs. So I visited that and then I also visited PAMAS which is an organisation in Dundee University, um, who again have developed this innovative bereavement and loss project and have a lot of excellent resources. And I'll tell you about that experience of both of those uh, individually. So first of all, the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice Glasgow. This is a three year project which has just finished, so they don't have their final report and, and all written up yet. Um, but it was jointly facilitated by a practice development um, leader in the hospice uh, with a seconded senior learning disability nurse who worked within the hospice to bring about this project. They amazingly had additionally funding from the Scottish Government, which was fantastic, and also from Hospice UK within their widening access programme. And it was about promoting and endorsing an ethos of collaboration between the two services across the Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Within that, they had lots of events and workshops, um, and they did actually link in with acute and primary care as well, which is very essential in palliative care. And within this project, links have been made at local and strategic level. It's been linked in with end-of-life care and, palliative and learning disability strategies, um, and very much is a joint, uh, joint working. It includes all six adult hospice and all learning disability services, which if I remember correctly, there are nine within the geographical region. And as I've said, it also extends to acute care and primary care, and those folks would have attended the events and the workshops. And really it's about fusion of our knowledge and skills to empower staff to deliver quality of care to people with learning disabilities. Now let me just tell you some of the outcomes from this project, which as I've said, the final report isn't right yet. First of all, established key practitioners. There were about 30 of them who came to these events and workshops and who met bi-monthly. If you'd like to log on to their website, you will learn more about the project. You'll learn more about some of the, the resources that they have on that website. Um, I've got it there on the slide for you. And they have an A to Z list of resources and a care pathway for people with learning disabilities at end of life. And this is endorsed within the Scottish Learning Disability Strategy, which is wonderful. They've audited the care pathway with 29 people, and they looked at um, measuring it against the health inequalities framework and find improved outcomes for the majority of patients. They also used diaries and questionnaires and other means of uh, taking data as well, but very positively eva evaluated through this audit. 
So that's the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice in Glasgow, which for me really visually showed me partnership in action. I'd read it in research studies, I'd seen it in my own study, but these were people who'd taken the ball and really ran with it. Um, and that is, that is still ongoing. Okay, so Pamis Dundee then. Uh, another uh, lovely visit and I had much learning here. And key to the work which PAMs do is working very closely with families. So they worked in partnership with people, and I've put this slide wrong, it should be profound and multiple learning disabilities and their carers. Now, that can be a confusing term. What do we mean by pro profound uh, learning and multiple learning disabilities? And sometimes the other term that's used, I think, explains it better in that it's profound intellectual disabilities and multiple disabilities because somebody with a learning disability can also have a sensory or a physical disability and a very complex needs. And it's that group of patients or people or clients or whatever you choose to call them that Pam has worked with. So they have, uh, and I spent some time in their information and library services and uh, was fascinated with some of the resources that they had, found it a very interesting experience. But the main thing I wanted to look at was this innovative bereavement and loss project aimed at developing support for people with profound and multiple learning disabilities in their carers. There's been a skill of thought for some time, uh, maybe in the past more so than now, that people with learning disabilities don't form relationships and don't actually grieve. But thankfully research has put that to bed and we know that people with learning disabilities do form relationships and do very much grieve. But we've tended to focus maybe on people with mild to moderate learning disabilities. What this project has done has shown that people with profound learning disabilities also need support because they too form relationships and they too grieve. And that's a very important point and came over very poignantly to me. This project um, was really set up at the request of parents of people with profound learning disabilities because they could see that uh, loss, when someone experienced a loss, their, their family member, uh, they could see some of the reactions that they were having. And there were interviews done before this actual resource was developed. I'm just going to read you two things that two family members said. So this is Isabel, a mother, describing the effects of bereavement on her son. There was such a great bond, very strong bond, between Stephen and his dad. When his dad died, Stephen went off food and was vomiting regularly. This went on for three years and he lost a lot of weight. Okay, and this is another one from another mother. Daniel will look at pictures and I can put a DVD on, but if I put the sound up to hear his dad's voice, the tears start and his whole facial expression changes. So what we've got here, and it's not that this is maybe new knowledge because you know, they're, they're, we have known that this is possible, that, that people with profound learning disabilities do grieve. But this is actually evidence now, and this is an actual pack that is actually um, there for people to work with people in this way. And there are lots of guidelines within it. Um, you will appreciate it as a very sensitive area, a skilled area, but yet there are simple things that can be done with multisensory work. And I know that the children's hospices use a lot of multisensory work, and that's great. But there's multisensory stories, um, they may use complementary therapy, um, they use lots of different regular uh, activities, maybe just with this particular group. And if you want to see the pack, or go onto their website, you learn a bit more about it. They provide a two-day training course, and I didn't do that training course, so I can't go into great detail about it. But certainly, reading the pack and hearing about the, story, the, the course, I think it's a very worthwhile project. They also provide information for family carers who've experienced the loss of someone with refined learning disability. And I should say this pack has two units. So one is for people supporting the person with profound learning disabilities, and the other is then for family carers in their grief of having lost a loved one with a profound learning disability. Okay, so that's PAMIS. So what were the outcomes then of my fellowship? And the outcomes of the fellowship were that I now have three video podcasts of live examples of good practice that have been created and are going to be embedded within this resource. So both PAMIS and Princess Alice Hospice, the leads in these projects, speak and show some of their work within these video podcasts. They've turned out well and um, we got a local film company to do them and that was great. 
So that's going to be put into the creation of this open access online resource. We've done quite a bit of work on it over the summer with uh, Matt Birch, our e-learning developer, and myself. Um, and it needs to, when that's finished, it needs to be reviewed by the project team, then go out to the expert reference group. And I'm delighted that we plan to host it not only on QUB website, but also in Orland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care. And it will be accessible nationally and internationally. My time okay, Carl? Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, we hope then to have a launch maybe in early 2016. Um, we've got an action plan for all of this. And that will very much be about promoting awareness uh, of this resource and promoting the usage of it because you can develop something, but you've got to let people know about it. You've got to get them to engage with it. And hopefully that will be easier because it is actually free at the point of delivery. Um, we will have publicity information events. We'll have an electronic poster campaign. And we will have, within this then, dissemination of examples of best practice. And as an educationist, I would hope generation of professional competency acquisition. I can't say now I've maybe used all of um, Kevin's strategies. Maybe we need to get you on my project <laughs> team. <laughs> so who do I want to thank then? I think I've probably left QUB out of here. So in case somebody sees this, I want to thank Queen's for letting me away on my week's fellowship. Um, but also special thanks in particular to the All Ireland Institute for the funding, and I'm very grateful for that. I want to thank my two sites, the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice Glasgow, and Pamela and Dundee, and also the HSC Research and Development Division, who funded the original project that the DVD came out of, and which, if you like, is what I'm building the online resource on. And I know this is bandied about. At every conference you go to and every textbook you open. But for me, it's one of the most powerful quotes when it comes to people with learning disability. And you all know it, so I'm just going to leave it up there with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.